This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I hate to stop what sounds like happy conversation, but uh, we have come to a, the time for a gathering as a people of God to worship. I invite all of you to uh, sign and then pass along the pew, the friendship pads, so we can have a record of you being here with us today. Whether you are a member of the church or visiting with us, we want to know that you have been here, and uh, we'd like to be able to uh, have a record. If you're visiting with us and uh, we don't have your contact information, we'd like to have that if you don't mind, uh, so we can be in touch with you and extend a more formal welcome. We're glad to have Kathy Johnson here among us down from Boston, uh, providing uh, a, her gift, sharing her gift of music with us. It's always a treat, and uh, we're, we're grateful anytime she's down home so that we can uh, uh, be the beneficiaries of her marvelous voice. As we look at the back of the bulletin, I just want to highlight a few of the things going on in the life of the church uh, today and uh, this week. You see that this, uh, late this afternoon, 5 o'clock, is a Christian education teacher leader gathering that signals the fact that we are about to embark on a new year, a new program year in our life together. Next Sunday morning, uh, we'll be having a, a church school kickoff breakfast. Again, this marks a new beginning, a new a school year, a new church school year together, which means this is always a very exciting and busy time in the life of the church. Tomorrow evening at 5.30, the Presbyterian women also kick off their new year. And so uh, we invite you to come and be a part of that gathering tomorrow evening, beginning at about 5.30 p.m. A reminder to members of the session that we have our monthly meeting on uh, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. One change in the schedule on Wednesday morning, the early bird speaker, it has listed there as Ron Garber. He has swapped with Wesley Williams, so Wesley will be the speaker. Those of uh, uh, us early birders uh, know that we're in for a treat hearing Wesley speak. There's some uh, confusion perhaps about whether or not this coming Saturday is going to be the last Habitat for Humanity work day. That's what it says in the bulletin, but I just got word right before walking in here that, this, that yesterday may have been the last day. The crew may have been so efficient that they had, may have done yesterday's work and next week's work, but uh, it, it, it's particularly important for those who are signed up to take lunch next week to make sure, uh, beca because if there are workers next week, it would be good for them uh, to have lunch. And so. If you're a Habitat worker, uh, please be in touch uh, with Scott or, or check, be, be uh, checking your email this week about whether or not a work day will actually be needed this coming, uh, this coming Saturday. But you see various things are getting started. The senior highs have a, 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 a trip to Charlotte on Saturday. That's for a whitewater rafting experience at that uh, National Whitewater Rafting Training Center. It's a great, a great thing to do. And then the church school kickoff on Sunday morning. The rock stars get together, start a new year together. The middle school has their kickoff. So there's a lot going on in the life of the church this week. Uh, the, some of the ongoing things that we do, the FPC Shares program, again, during this month, we encourage you to bring your favorite non-perishable food item so that we can help stock some of the local food pantries that depend on our generosity. And you've been reading and hearing about the fabulous First Presbyterian Church Marketplace, the events that are going to take place uh, the, the, the uh, very first part of uh, October. The, um, several folks have wanted to know how they can participate. There are lots of there are volunteer opportunities. You, you can donate items that can be sold. In particular, the, the folks who are running the kids boutique have decided to expand uh, what they're selling to include uh, Halloween costumes. If you have uh, children's Halloween costumes uh, that your children or grandchildren can't uh, have outgrown and you don't have a use for them and you would like to clear out that space in your attic for something else, uh, bring them here and, um, and, and place them in the drop-off uh, box for the kids' boutique and we will try to give new life to old uh, Halloween uh, costumes because it seems like superheroes just get recycled and uh, you know they're, if it was out of date a couple years ago they'll be back so that's a way you can participate in this uh, fabulous FPC marketplace. 
But again, we're glad you're here as we worship God together. I invite you to use the time of the prelude to continue preparing yourself for this time of sacred worship. Please join in the responsive call to worship printed in the bulletin. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and remember all of God's kindness to us. Remember that God has forgiven us, healed us, redeemed us, loved us. Bless the Lord, O my soul and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name.
please be seated. Gathered together as God's people, we realize that we fall short of God's plan for humanity. Let us confess our sin and seek God's forgiving grace as we pray together the prayer of confession. Forgive us, O oh God, when we reduce the Christian life to a size and a scale that suits us. Forgive us when we, who have been called to follow Jesus, come up with a set of rules to follow instead. Forgive us when we become perfect keepers of the law, but fail to be attentive to the neighbor in need. Remind us that for Jesus, keeping the law meant loving you and loving others. By the power of your spirit, help us live in obedience to that law, and in so doing, bring honor and glory to you. It is through grace, God's unmerited favor, that we are forgiven in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God.
if you weren't sanctified when you got here, you should be now. Ready for prayer. Among our pastoral concerns this morning, uh, there was no one that we know of from the congregation in the hospital this morning. Houston Black was in this past week for heart cath, but he's uh, back on his feet, was here this morning. Uh, we learned this week that Catherine Stewart has uh, been out with, she's had several eye operations re related to glaucoma. She sees her Duke doctors in Cary this week. Elizabeth Elliott is improving at Blue Ridge Healthcare. And Helen Smith, longtime member of this church in her 90s, is in uh, hospice care in Dallas, North Carolina, near her son Scott. Uh, she's the aunt of our Fran Smith. As the bulletin indicates, Marie Pulley uh, was killed in a car crash this past Saturday. Her service was here Wednesday. Her, she was quite a personality. Her uh, closest relative was nephew Keith, her adopted son, and her loving friend, of course, was Nathan. So let us come to God now in a time of prayer. Gracious God, we're blessed to be in your presence this morning. Some of us barely made it here. Others may have felt something urging them to be here. For whatever reason, the Holy Spirit guided them here, and we pray they've drawn close to you and are listening for your word and guidance. Lord, what would you have us do at this moment in our lives? How do we use these gifts you've given us? Which decision is the best to make for all concerned? Lord, where there is hurt, we pray that healing has already begun and the injured ones are being made well. Where there is confusion, we pray that the clouds are already lifting and vision is being restored. And where there is discouragement, the light of hope is beginning to dawn and new energy is being discovered within and smiles are returning. Gracious God, you've given us so much and one of the secrets to happiness seems to be realizing that what we have is what we truly need and to be grateful. To be grateful for our mustard seed of faith and for our daily bread. Dear God, we thank you for the life of Marie Pulley, one who lived life fully and whose motto was, don't let what you can't do keep you from what you can do. Gracious God, be with us as we do what we can do. As we will sing, fill our hearts with your fullness so that they may overflow with kind thoughts and glowing words in your praise. Use me, Lord. Use even me. Lord, prosper the work of our hands as we build your kingdom and as we join our hands and hearts in prayer as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Morning. I'd like to invite the children to join me up front, please. Good morning. Smaller crowd this week. God bless you. I'm so glad everybody's here today. Tell me, raise your hand if you started school already. Yeah. Raise your hand if you're going to start school this week. Very good. Anybody starting school later than this week? No, this week, yeah, that's what I thought. 
Well, I want you and all of you to stand up if you are going to start some sort of school or if you already have recently. If you're starting a new Sunday school class, a college class, a Wake Tech class, any sort of class, I want you to stand up. Not all at once. You can all stand, you can all stand. You're taking a class, very good, very good, awesome. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, you can sit down. Now, I want you to stand up if you are teaching a Sunday school class, if you are teaching a college course or a high school course, anything like that, I want you to stand up. Daddy. Awesome, look at all those teachers, thank you. So today we want to remember that God goes with us where we go, that God is with us and working in our hearts, and we want to share that with people. Today I want to challenge you and all of you to go into your jobs as teachers or as a dentist or a doctor or a paralegal. A Lego worker, a Lego worker too, especially them. <laughs> or a meteorologist, and go into your jobs and bring in Christ with you. And how I think that looks is what we said in our confession, which said, sometimes we fail to be attentive to a neighbor in need. Remind us that for Jesus, keeping the law meant loving you and loving others. And we share God's love with others by showing love and helpfulness and all sorts of things like that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these in my prayer. So I want to have a prayer, and I'm going to say all the words this time, okay? So you listen and pray with me. Have a seat, Solomon. Let us pray. Dear God, you ask us to show your love to everyone and share the good news of the gospel. You have given each of us one of each one of us gifts and strengths to help us do that help each of these students and all of us discover and develop our gifts and strengths and know how to use them for your purposes help us remember that we are doing your work when we are kind and caring to others when we do our best in our studies and other activities when we respect others and ourselves and when we help to make things better for others be with us as we start our new school year. Go with us and guide us along the way. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Very good. Thank you for joining me. Let us pray. O oh God, by your spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The scripture is from the New Testament, the 13th chapter of Luke, verses 10 through 17. Hear the word of the Lord. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, 
and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you have your Bibles open to read that text, you know that the very that our next text are just the succeeding verses as we stay in the 13th chapter of Luke's Gospel and begin our reading at the 18th verse. Listen again to God's word for us. Jesus said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like, and what should I compare it? It is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in the garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again he said, To what should I compare the kingdom of God? It is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour, until all of it was leavened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again let us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, pour out your Spirit upon us as we gather here this day. Give us all the gift of your Spirit that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. On more than one occasion, you have heard me mention the name of Fred Craddock. Fred Craddock was a professor of New Testament at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University. Was also one of my favorite preachers, one of the favorite preachers I have to listen to. And maybe I've told this story, it's one of my favorite stories that he tells. It's a story of a neighbor of his, a church-going woman, who had the uncanny ability to draw him into her favorite trap, which was to call into question his Christian conviction while taking comfort in the superiority of her own. This is how one of their conversations would go. They would just be visiting as neighbors on her porch, talking about this and that, talking about nothing in particular, talking about how the how the best way it is to keep weeds out of your garden or bugs off the roses, when rather innocently she would say, have you and Nettie seen such and such a movie, the one that everybody's talking about? And Fred Craddock would say, why yes, Nettie and I went to see it at the Friday afternoon matinee, got the senior discount, got a big tub of popcorn, we enjoyed it very much, have you seen it? To which she would reply, no. I don't think Christians ought to go to movies. (laughs) You see how that works. More than once she had done this to him, asked him an innocent sounding question, baited the trap with small talk, got him to admit something when he didn't realize he was admitting something, and then bam, the trap was set. Have you been to the Sunday buffet at the new place on Main Street, she would ask. Why, yes, Nettie and I enjoyed it just last week. It was wonderful. The food is so fresh, such a wonderful variety. Have you been? No. I don't think Christians ought to go out to eat on Sunday. (laughs) There she goes again, luring him into her trap and then snapping it shut. Mission accomplished. She could keep rocking there on her porch, feeling smug in her own righteousness, while Fred Craddock had to slip back across the street and tell Nettie that the two of them were pagans. (laughs) Maybe you know people like that. They have decided what Christians are supposed to do and not supposed to do, and they take great delight in spotting a supposed Christian doing something that is on their not-to-do list. And there are extra points if you catch them doing something they're not supposed to be doing on Sunday. I don't do it often, but every now and then the week gets away from me and I have to cut my grass on Sunday afternoon. 
but I always wear dark glasses when I do. Because <laughs> I don't want my neighbors to know it's me. <laughs> and I would not want one of them to run into one of you at the Harris Teeter and embarrass you by telling you that your preacher was cutting his grass on a Sunday. I wouldn't want you to have to live with that shame. <laughs> people are particular about what other people do on the Sabbath, or at least they used to be. The fourth commandment calls us to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, and through the years, people have taken that commandment seriously, as well they should. But occasionally, they have added their own layer of interpretation to how the Sabbath should be remembered, and that's usually where the debate begins. For example, there was a time when Jesus was in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and Jesus is up there teaching, doing what a rabbi would do, hoping he's making connections with his congregation, hoping that some of what he's saying is sinking in when he looks out at the crowd and notices a woman. A woman whose body was bent. A woman who was enduring hardship because her body was contorted. And all of a sudden, she became more interesting to him and more important to him than the lesson he's teaching. Or more to the point, through her, he wants to teach a new lesson. And so he spoke to her and he touched her and for the first time in 18 years she could stand up straight. For the first time in 18 years she could look up. For the first time in 18 years she could lift her eyes to heaven and praise God which is the very first thing she did. It was a miracle. It was a wonderful moment of healing and wholeness. God's power had been at work and a life had been changed. But the chairman of the synagogue board was not pleased. Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Now, it didn't look to me like it took any great effort on his part. He spoke to her, he touched her, and that was that. But the chairman of the synagogue board had made his ruling. Healing on the Sabbath is not allowed. Jesus had violated one of the sacred laws of the people of God. But in Jesus' mind, he had remembered the Sabbath day and kept it holy. The purpose of the Sabbath, you see, is to enhance human life. It is to provide a moment of relief, some gracious space in the midst of our anxious striving. It is to let go for a moment and to trust in the gracious provision of God. Jesus knew that the Sabbath is a day given to us to enhance our lives, to remind us of the joy of living, to remind us of the abundance of God's grace. And to Jesus, it seemed like the perfect moment to set a woman free from a lifetime of bondage. Now, he could have done what the synagogue chairman of the board would have had him do. He could have told the woman to come back tomorrow. But why? She had been enduring this burden for 18 years. Why make her wait another day? Why not let this Sabbath day be a day of gladness for her? Why wait until tomorrow when her life can be transformed today? For as Jesus pointed out, these legalists have no problem untying their ox on the Sabbath day so that it can go get a drink of water, but they were incensed that Jesus would untie a woman so that she could get on with her life. But that's different, they would say. And Jesus would say, how is it different? 
and they didn't have a good answer for that. You see, some people just love laws because laws make it easy to figure out who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And Jesus knew that laws have a function in the human community and in the community of faith, but he also knew that laws have a letter and a spirit. And again and again, when he was in the presence of human pain and suffering, he would always choose the spirit over the letter. The danger with any discipleship that is based on laws is that discipleship then becomes about what we are not supposed to do. In the first century church, they had their own lists. Christians weren't supposed to eat meat offered to idols. Men shouldn't have long hair. Women shouldn't have short hair. And in the modern era, there have been prohibitions, as you know, of dancing and playing cards. The list goes on. Christians shouldn't do this. Christians shouldn't do that. You can't be a Christian if you do this, this, and this. You must not be a Christian if you do this, that, and the other thing. Statements like that should make us nervous. Because more often than not, they emerge not from a word from above but from someone's own idea about what is and is not appropriate behavior. The Apostle Paul thought he put a stop to this sort of legalism over in Romans when he said, in effect, if you want to eat meat, eat meat. If you don't want to eat meat, don't eat meat. If you want to cut your hair, cut your hair. If you don't want to cut your hair, don't cut your hair. He didn't say this, but he would have said, if you want to dance, dance. If you don't want to dance, don't dance. But whatever you do, he would say, do to the glory of God. And quit trying to force other people into your definition of righteousness. And I know you've heard me say this before, but my theory is that people who like to turn the Christian faith into a set of laws do so because it's easier to follow a set of laws than it is to follow Jesus. If I have a list that says don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, 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 and this, as long as I haven't done this, 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 or this, then I can consider my righteousness intact. And that's a whole lot easier than trying to pattern my life after the life of Jesus. Because following Jesus involves loving sacrificially. It involves giving my life away for people who don't deserve it. Forgiving those who will sin again tomorrow. Following a list of laws, particularly when it's a list of laws that I have edited myself. Following a list of laws is almost always easier than following Jesus. But the Christian church in my estimation, can't afford to be a community of people whose chief ambition is to see how many things we can't do. Because the church has too many things to do. When Jesus gathered his followers, he didn't spend a lot of time saying to them, now if you want to be on my team, let me tell you a few things you're not supposed to do. Oh, there are a few things he said we're not supposed to do. He said we're not supposed to make a big show of our faith. He didn't want us to pray in public as a way of drawing attention to ourselves. And he didn't want us to shoo away the children. But mostly he didn't give his disciples or us a list of things not to do. He was too busy giving us things to do. Feed the hungry. Love the outcast. Heal the sick. Forgive the sinner. Eat with anybody. Live simply, pray constantly, give away what you have, God will provide more tomorrow. <clears throat> Jesus was trying to accomplish something grand in this world, and he needed disciples who, if they ran into a bent over woman on the Sabbath, would not tell her to come back tomorrow, but who would reach out to her and touch her and make her well today. 
It is no accident, I don't think, that this story about the healing on the Sabbath is followed by two parables of the kingdom. Because Jesus came into the world to establish a kingdom, and here he is having to argue with the chairman of the synagogue board about whether it's okay to transform a person's life on the Sabbath. Jesus has great things to do. And he's in here arguing with a small-minded man who is too religious for his own good. Or anyone else's good. Fred Craddock's neighbor, bless her heart, had reduced the Christian life to a list of things that you shouldn't do. And to her credit, it is certainly true that there are things that followers of Jesus should not do. But there is so much more to following Jesus than avoiding behaviors on a list. For when we follow Jesus, we follow one who loved when he might have judged, who embraced when he might have ignored. We follow one who forgave when he might have forsaken. And when a person stood before him in need and in pain, he didn't look at a calendar to see what day it was. He looked at her. And the law he followed was the law of love. Quite frankly, I doubt if Jesus is bothered when Christians go to the movies or even to a Sunday buffet. It might bother him when I cut my grass on Sunday. So I'll have to think about that. But when we fail to love, when we fail to serve, when we withhold forgiveness, when we withhold kindness, when we judge unfairly or deal cruelly, or when we think ourselves superior to any of our neighbors, Jesus must wonder who we've begun to follow. Because it must be clear to him that we've stopped following him. Yes, following a set of rules might be easier, but following Jesus is what our lives are supposed to be about. And the irony is, is that when we follow Jesus, we end up following the laws that matter anyway. For we end up being people who speak the truth and value life and live in faithful relationships. And more than likely, if we are people who follow Jesus, we'll remember the Sabbath day and we'll keep it holy because we will do whatever we do, seeking the glory of God. And like Jesus, we'll always have our eyes open for those among us who are in pain. Anyone among us who is bent or broken, anyone among us who needs healing mercy and a loving embrace then we'll know that we are finally on the right path. When we have begun to look at each other the way Jesus looks at us, and when we begin to look at all of our neighbors and see in them what Jesus sees, then we will more fully understand what it means for Jesus to be our Lord and for him to be at work in our lives. Sure, it's easier to follow a set of laws, but there is deep joy to be found in following him. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
Please remain standing as we affirm our faith using the historic words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I don't think there's a specific law about giving that it has to be in dollars or shekels, but there is a wisdom that in giving, it is in the giving that we receive. And it is in giving that we remind ourselves that we're obeying the law of Christ's love. So let us present to God our tithes and offerings. Dear Lord, we gather on this Sabbath day, bringing these gifts from our previous days of work, from our harvesting of your blessings. We give in response to your greatest law, that we are to love you with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Dear Lord, bless these gifts used in your service. Amen. <laughs>
Friends in Christ, resist the temptation to make discipleship something manageable or easy or small. Jesus calls us to the grand work of his kingdom, the grand and challenging work of proclaiming his goodness and shining his light. Jesus calls us to lives of purpose and glory, to lives of challenge and discipleship. Go out into the world seeking to live up to that calling, depending on God's grace as you do. And may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessings of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and abide with you, with those you love and with God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.